good good uh, so last time we discussed uh, last three lectures i think or two lectures we discussed uh, rapidly varied flow and in that we discussed flow over spillways and that helped us to design spillway shapes at least uh, different types of shapes we discussed now we'll uh, discuss second type of uh, rapidly varying flow which is hydraulic jump okay uh, so let us see this we have already discussed flow over spillways now this is uh, today we'll discuss mostly hydraulic jump what is the hydraulic jump? We have discussed it. We have discussed different types of hydraulic jump on horizontal uh, rectangular channels, which was weak jump, oscillatory jump, standing jump, and then uh, we had strong jump. So five, I think five, six types of jumps we discussed. What happens in this? This is a flume, okay? Um, experimental flume. You have low flow, high velocity here. So the depth of the flow is low. And then downstream, you have depth of the flow is quite high. Okay, so the velocity downstream is quite high. Let's say V1 here and V2 here. So this velocity is quite high. It's supercritical flow and this is subcritical flow. And when they join, they form a hydraulic jump. So this part, this guy here is hydraulic jump. So we have discussed this in detail. So first we need upstream flow should be supercritical. So that means fluid number should be greater than one. Um, so then what happens is uh, uh, two things, two, this can happen in two cases. The jump can ha happen in two cases. When the slope decreases downstream, for example, if you have high uh, slope here, so the flow velocity is high, okay? And then suddenly the slope decreases, the normal depth here will be a little bit higher. Normal depth here will be low, and so the hydraulic jump can happen. Or it can also happen when you have, you know, uh, when you confine the basin, let's say this is the area, this is the width of the channel. And if you suddenly confine the width, uh, the depth will increase because the area has to be constant. If the area has to be constant, depth of the flow will increase. So this will have low depth, this will have high depth. That time also uh, a hydraulic jump can happen. Hydraulic jump has too many applications, and most common application is uh, we want to prevent scouring on the downstream side of the structure. Uh, what I mean by that, if you have a spillway, for example, here, right, and uh, after that you have a river, <coughs> the flow velocity over the spillway or a sluice gate, you can have sluice gate also, is quite high. So this velocity will be quite high. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> if the channel downstream is not protected well, right, this high velocity can cause cow downstream and it can damage the channel. So we want to, because because it has it's super critical flow, it has a lot of kinetic energy. And if we start a jump here, all that kinetic energy will be dissipated and downstream the flow velocity will be less because the depth is more. When the downstream stream, uh, flow velocity is less, so we can make sure that scouring doesn't happen in the natural channels. Um, <clears throat> second use of this is it's also used for aeration. Um, because the, it is hydraulic jump and uh, there is a lot of turbulence, turbulence it can uh, capture um, air from, uh, from the atmosphere. Okay, So we can get oxygen from this and which will help us to biodegrade organic matter. And then third thing, uh, it helps us mixing chemicals because there is a lot of energy dissipation here in the hydraulic jump. So if we want to mix uh, chemicals, this eddies forming here will mix the chemicals quite efficiently. So that's also an uh, advantage. The fourth advantage is, uh, for example, when you have a let's say here you have a sluice gate okay so flow is happening like this um so flow velocity quite here is quite large right and um, here you have apron okay so this is normally of concrete uh, here, that the depth of flow is let's say it was a dam or something the depth of flow the depth of water is y1 
the death will cause some if the if the uh, foundation is porous right if this is on a uh, porous foundation like soils there will be some pore fluid pressure because of the permeability of the soil right hydraulic conductivity uh, you can get from the rc's equation so at this point also there will be because this is porous media so there will be some pores which will have pressure and that pressure will be gamma into y that we call it is a it basically tries to up, uplift this basin here we will call this tilling basin okay but when we cause a hydraulic jump here the depth above the this tilling basin we are increasing okay so that basically gives us extra weight to the basin to basically avoid uplifting pressure so that's another advantage if there was no hydraulic jump okay for example the depth is continuously like this that depth is quite less okay so basically the volume of water on the basin is less uh, so we have less weight on on the basin uh, which means we have less resistance to this uplift uplift pressure here uh, the third <coughs> which is quite obvious is for example if you have a the, in this case for example if you have a channel on the side of on this side you know on the on the another side you have channel which is little bit higher let's say the channel was somewhere here and it's going some on the downstream side and this is for irrigation purpose if we don't make a hydraulic jump the depth will be this much and it will not allow water to go to the side channel right because the side channel has higher elevation so what we do if you if we create a hydraulic jump here it has sufficient height it has sufficient depth for the uh, channel for the side channel okay so that can also be useful to increase the head for irrigation purposes or hydropower purposes so those are some uh, applications we use in engineering but if the hydraulic jump also is problematic sometimes for example if we do not control the hydraulic jump it can damage the channel bed and it can damage the banks we'll discuss that in detail soon um and it can cause erosion of the structures like spillways if we have spillway here it can sometimes cause erosion uh, at this toe toe end also okay and bridges also it can cause erosion and uh, sometimes what we don't want is the mixing sediment mixing okay we want clear water for our you know water supply purposes uh, but when we have a hydraulic jump like we said it's efficient in mixing chemicals and it's also efficient in mixing uh, soils so sediment mixing can be a problem and then again uh, in hydraulic jump because there are too many turbulent eddies uh, some important um, aquatic animal like fish cannot survive and there are a lot of instances when hydraulic jumps have basically caused deaths in rec recreations so those are some of the misadvantages problems associated with hydraulic jump if we do not control it properly if we control it properly then it is advantageous for us so let's review uh, because we have discussed a little bit about hydraulic jump in i think lecture 4 or 5 uh, so we know there is significant loss of energy in hydraulic jump and that energy loss cannot be easily calculated because we don't know the exact velocity distributions in the hydraulic jump and uh, obviously because when there are energy losses from one section to another section right uh, we cannot equate specific energy at this point at, at this point because this point has high specific energy this point has low specific energy and we don't know how much is the loss uh, with energy equation so that we have to understand and specific energy we know it only applies to gradually varied or parallel flow okay it does not apply to rapidly varied flow so based on then we discussed okay we cannot use specific energy so we cannot use energy equation uh, we cannot um, uh, use for example delta e by delta y is equal to zero so that specific energy critical condition we cannot use but we can use momentum equation okay upstream momentum we can use not inside the inside the hydraulic jump because we don't know velocity distribution here but upstream of the hydraulic jump we can assume okay velocity is uniform downstream of the hydraulic jump we can assume velocity is uniform uh, so we can use momentum equation in this we said okay momentum at this point minus momentum at this point should be equal to the total force acting 
on the on this control volume, right? This control volume. And then we said, based on that, we uh, divided, found an equation which we said, okay, specific force at this section F1 should be equal to specific force at this one. Not the energies, but specific force we can basically equate. Uh, so that was basically momentum per unit weight. And for rectangular channel, uh, we know the area is uh, basically Y into B. Y is the depth of the flow, B is the width of the channel. And we know Y bar, which is basically uh, centroid of the section is Y by two. So we can simplify that specific force with this equation. Now this is nothing but Q square divided by GA plus Y bar A. But in our case, we are assuming a rectangular channel and there are other assumptions also. For example, here alpha is one, beta, sorry, beta is one. Um, and then we are, we are assuming small slope of the channel. Other things are also we are assuming. So, but this was the specific force we is, uh, assume. And when we assume rectangular channel, we get this equation. If you assume this equation and uh, you try to find out, okay, what is the uh, relation between Y1 and Y2? <coughs> With the help of momentum equation, you should be able to find out this equation. Okay. So this will give us the equation in hyperbolic term, the relation of uh, initial depth and sequent depth. We remember, I think, I hope you remember, uh, you remember that this depth is called a sequent depth rather than alternate depth. Alternate depth was when the energies were equal. Sequent depth is when the uh, specific force is equal. So this we can calculate this equation. I hope you have derived it somewhere. Did I ask you to derive in quiz or some somewhere? Or do you guys know this equation? Madhav, Arvind? It was in, we derived it in tutorial, sir. Okay, good, good. So we know this equation is valid for a hydraulic jump. So the point is, hydraulic jump will happen if the initial depth and the sequence depth sets by this equation. Okay, so that was the purpose of putting this guy here. If initial depth and the sequence depth does not satisfy this condition, so that means there is no hydraulic jump. Now let's move on. So in deriving these equations and in following discussion, we assume that the jump occurs over short distances, so shear forces can be neglected. So we don't have any head loss due to shear friction. All the head loss is because of the eddies and the turbulence. And we assume rectangular channel. Um, but most of the equations can be as, you know, used for trapezoidal channel sections also. Uh, and effect of gravity is small. So this can be um, done by either assuming that the channel slope is small. So cos theta is zero, uh, cos theta is one. And the jump occurs over short distances. When I say effect of gravity, I mean the effect of the weight of the this soil mass, fluid mass. So either when we said the jump is happens over small distance, I can sometimes ignore the uh, weight of the fluid in deriving equations. So there are some characteristics that we need to discuss seriously um, so that we can design proper um, kind of scaling basins, proper hydraulic jumps we can design, we can locate the hydraulic jumps. Some of that, <coughs> some of those characteristics we'll discuss today. Um, Hydraulic, so this is energy loss. We know from section one to section two, this is section one here, this is section two here. We know there is some an energy loss due to these turbulent eddies, right? So that energy loss we can calculate E1 uh, is equal to E2 plus HL, but we don't know HL, but because with the help of momentum equation, we know how, how we can find Y2, okay? how we can uh, find y1 and how they are related with the help of momentum equation and energy equation, then only we can uh, find out the total uh, head loss. With the help of energy equation alone, we cannot do that. But with the help of both energy and momentum equation, you should be able to find out this equation specifically for rectangular channels. That is the energy loss. I might ask you to derive these equations in exam. So you should be quite um, uh, 
familiar with these equations. Let's say, so then there is efficiency of the gel. So efficiency is basically energy at downstream section divided by energy at upstream section. And energy, uh, mostly because we are seeing a horizontal channel, so energy will be specific energy. Okay, there is specific energy at section two, specific energy at section one. We can also, all of them relate to fluid number one. So that is approach fluid number. Okay, so efficiency depends on the approach fluid number. And this actually we discussed, we said, okay, if the fluid number one is, uh, if fluid number at section one is, um, let's say 1.0, 1. Mm, 1. I think, to two, it is a weak jump. And in that we said there is less loss of energy. So that was this guy actually. And then we said if the fluid number one increases, we have higher and higher energy losses. So that basically comes from this also. <clears throat> you, you know the fluid number, you can easily find out how much is the energy loss. So we can easily find out that energy loss equation. This is basically E1 minus E2 divided by E1. E2 divided by E1. So that is relative <coughs> loss. So this is delta E. Okay, this, so this is the delta E divided by E1. So this is loss in the energy. When you divide by E1, this is relative loss, relative with respect to the initial energy. Okay. For example, for we know for strong jumps, the energy, relative energy loss can be 60% also. So if, if the initial energy is 10 meters, as we're talking on the heads, in <coughs> strong jumps, uh, the loss can be more than 60%. So we can have six meters loss of energy also in strong jumps. Then another parameter is the height of the jump, okay? So let's say the, if this is the channel and uh, uh, this is this very steep jump and this is the normal, this is Y2. And this guy is Y1. So the dif difference between Y2 and Y1, so that is this much, is called the height of the jump. Okay, Y2 divided by Y1. And if you divide the entire thing by E1, they basically we want to make everything dimensionless because this is meters e is also in meters we're talking about heads so this guy is dimension this should be here y2 okay so that will be that will give us height of the jump uh, for understanding purposes sometimes you can just ignore this guy here just say this is the height of the jump okay i don't know what's happening here Okay, so that also we can find out an equation with respect to fluid number one, right? Uh, I will ask you to derive these equations. So that's that's why I have put them, because they are very simple. We don't have to be fighting with them. So based on the ab above discussion, what we see that most of these quantities, for example, Y1 uh, divided by E1. So E2 divided by E1, and uh, jump height divided by E1, Y1 divided by E1. Y2 divided by even all are dependent on fluid number one, approach fluid number. So in order to simplify your work in field later on, if you are a uh, hydrolysian, what you need to know is not the equations themselves, all the equations you don't need to know. You can just develop a curve like this. Okay, This curve is extremely helpful because it is all the equations on one figure. The equations we have discussed so far, which one was for E2 divided by E1, how that depends on F1, hydraulic jump height, how that depends on F1. All these equations are basically plotted here. Okay. For example, this curve is for Y1 divided by E1 uh, with respect to F1. This curve is for hydraulic jump height. Okay. How that depends on the fluid number one. And this curve is the sequent depth, how that depends on the fluid number one. Uh, similarly, this is the loss of the energy. So all the quantities, the beauty is all the quantities you can get just from this curve. Okay, if you know the approach fluid number. So that's why it's called characteristic curve sometimes. And then this has been verified by experimental data. Many, many experiments have been done on this. For example, this is a USPR experimental value, this dashed line. 
and they are saying uh, basically this curve is almost exactly as what we see from the experiments okay so and you can understand many things from this maximum relative height so that is maximum jump will be 0.5 times e1 okay so that that is uh, from this curve we can easily get that maximum relative height uh, and that happens and for example height of the jump it doesn't always increase with fluid number so you might think that if we increase the approach velocity then the height of the jump jump will be more higher so that that's not true if we look at this curve here this is the height of the jump the height of the jump attains a maximum value when the fluid number is 2.77 and the height is basically e at j divided by e1 is 0.5 so if e1 is 10 height of the jump will be about 5 meters okay but if you increase the fluid number the height of the jump is basically lower uh, than this maximum value so we can get that from this equation from this plot characteristic curve uh, maximum relative depth okay so that is y2 y2 divided by e1 that occurs at 1.73 so one fluid number 1.73, you will see the maximum relative depth occurs when the fluid number is this. And there are um, many experiments that have shown that the undular jump uh, ends at this point. Okay. So that is after we jump, you have undular jump, which has small undulations and oscillations at the top. Uh, so that at this point, 1.173 is the end of the undular jump. And after that, direct jump start. And if you see from these curves, Initially, the curvature of all these curves is high. This is high, and this is high, this is high. But when the fluid number increases, the curvature decreases. Okay. So the changes become more gradual. So those are some of the features uh, you can find out just by looking at the curve, okay, or just remembering these. So in the field, you don't have to you know, calculate each and every value. You just take this curve and find out the if your fluid number is one uh, what will be the height what will be the height of the jump the relative uh, the relative um, depth and the uh, y1 e2 you can also find and you say okay what if my discharge increases you know in, in case of floods so let's say fluid number change to four so you can over a wide range of uh, discharges you can easily find out how my, how the conditions of the channel or, or the uh, hydraulic jump will be here. So that's why this, this curve is quite useful in that case, in that sense. Um, any questions on this? Questions, fellows? Pranjal, any question? Okay, uh, since no questions, another important parameter is the uh, length of the jump. Okay, how long the, uh, is what, what is the length of the jump? So that is basically distance from the front face. Uh, if, if this is the bed, channel bed, and at this point the depth is Y1. Okay, from Y1 up to the point when the depth is Y2. Okay, so that will be the length of the jump. That is important as we'll see later. And uh, for this, there are basically no theory you can tell us exactly what's the length of the jump, but experimental investigations have given us some insights on this, that how the length of the jump varies with the initial fluid number. So that is approach fluid number. This is from USBR and it, this curve has been used extensively. Uh, so for smaller fluid numbers up to, let's say, for example, fluid number 4.5, let's say, um, the curve is quite steep, okay, there is a significant curvature of this curve, but so we have to look into this value in this curve and find out, okay, what's the value of length. If, if we know the fluid number is 3, we can easily find out the length of the jump will be this much, L divided by Y2, Y2 is the sequence depth. But after that, you will see this curve is almost flat, okay. Uh, from for fluid number 4.5 to at least 14. This is quite flat curve, and that is the most on the range we will see in our natural channels. 
So in that, we can say the length of the jump is simply six times the sequence. Okay. So we'll just use this equation rather than this curve when we know the fluid number is 4.5 to 4. Similarly, the another important uh, thing that we have to understand if we want to design, for example, retaining wall, right? Retaining wall is when you have a, let's say this is your spillway, and the flow is happening here, it's quite fast, and then you have a jump here. On both sides of this channel, right, you will have to make sure that the channel height, the uh, bank height is quite high. So in that case, we uh, design uh, retaining walls that can retain the flow. And for that, we have to know exactly up to what height we'll expect the flow to happen. Okay, so that is this guy right here. Uh, we can design that if we know that this height. So freeboard, we have to understand how much freeboard we need for retaining walls. And for that, we have to know exactly what is the height of the jump, this the surface profile. And uh, again, there have been experiments on this. We don't have clear theoretical data on this. So that is, this gives us x from the start, and this uh, on y-axis we get y. This y is the depth, but from this point to this point. So y2 is the sequent depth. So we can easily, from this equation, depending on the fluid number, we can take the curve. For example, fluid number one is this guy, 1.9. If we know, okay, at distance two, from the location, from this point, up to this, let's say this whole distance two, we can easily find out what what will be the height, what will be the depth, okay, of this uh, hydraulic jump. From this curve, we can easily see if we increase the fluid number, the steepness of the curve increases, right? So for small fluid numbers, the, the changes are a little bit uh, less gradual, okay? But for high fluid numbers, the changes are quite abrupt. And the maximum height is attained in, in short period, short distance. So that is the third, uh, that is the fifth uh, characteristic. Then sixth characteristic is the location of the jump. This is very important because if we want to design a stilling basin, a stilling basin is something on which the hydraulic jump happens. Okay, uh, Because we know hydraulic jump can be, you know, it can cause a lot of erosion. So we have to design a stilling basin uh, of concrete, reinforced concrete. We cannot use natural channels because it will erode the bed. So stilling basin is something on which uh, the, we make the hydraulic jump to happen. And for hydraulic jump to happen, we know this condition should, should satisfy. Uh, so, but this condition will give us y2 divided by y1. So it will give us when the hydraulic jump happens, but it does not include the length of the jump, okay? So we'll see how we can use the length of the jump to get a closer estimate of location of jump. So for this, uh, there's an example in Cha book. This is case one, case A. And we have a sluice gate here. And then downstream also we have, you can see it's a sill. Basically, it's, uh, it gives us additional depth of the flow. So the flow happens like this. And this curve from this point to this point, this is gradually varied flow, right? So we can get uh, the profile of gradually varied flow with gradually varied flow equation, right? In this case, we have M3 profile. And we can exactly know, because we have done those computations, we can exactly know what should be the depth of the flow at each and every point. But we know near critical depth, which is given in this dashed line. At critical depth, um, because the flow changes abrupt, rapidly varied, we cannot easily, this, this curve may not be varied. Gradually varied flow is not varied. But we have this, he has put this as dashed lines. Okay, so that, that is this guy here. But corresponding to that, from this equation, if this was our y1, we can easily find out what's the sequent depth. That sequent depth for each y, this, for example, for this sequent depth will be y, when you, when you equate f1 and f2 at second section, for example, you get this equation, right? 
So from this equation, uh, for each depth, we can get sequent depths. Okay. Uh, similarly, downstream also, we know this is a control section because a control section, we know what is the depth. And from that control section, we can easily find out what's the profile. In this case, let's say profile was M2 profile. So that M2 profile, we can extend up to this point C. Okay. Now with this equation, you will find out that the hydraulic jump happens at this point. Because at this point, we have this um, downstream profile, the depth is there. And at this point, we can easily find out y1 is this value and y2 is this value. So at this in inter intersection, this equation will tell us, OK, this intersection is basically the location of the jump. Okay, so that point. But we have not included the length of the jump. To, better, to find out the better estimate of the location of the jump, that is where the jump starts, uh, we have to use the length of the jump as well. So now what we will do, so sequence depths we have calculated, those are here. What we'll do, so after this, once we know this point F1, so that is this point was given by this equation, and we know the profiles. So we know Y1, right? Based on Y1, we can find out the depth of the, sorry, length of the jump. So that was, I think, given in the previous this plot. We know Y1 and Y2, we can find out the length of the jump. How much should be the length of the jump? Once we know the length of the jump, OK, uh, we can calculate the, we can use that length and try to see exactly where that length happens. For example, if the length was, let's say, 3 meters, length of the jump, we can try to see whether this curve and this curve match 3 meters. So this is not 3 meters. This is not 3 meters. This is 3 meters. Okay. So up to this point, to the sequence depth, we see, okay, this length is 3 meters. By This is by trial and error. Okay. And so that is the sequence depth. You will go directly down. You will find, okay, this is the new, new estimate of the hydraulic jump location. So G. Okay. Um, so that will be new estimate of the hydraulic jump. Now point E gives you the location of, so that is this one. Now for, for this point, you can again find out what is Y1 and Y2. So Y1 is this much, Y2 is this much. You can again find out the, for a better estimate, you can again find out uh, the length of the jump and again do the repetition. And eventually you will see that there is not much change in the depth, in the length of the jump and the location of the jump. So that is how you find out the exact location of the jump. Any any questions on this? Uh, yes, sir, sir. By extending, how are we getting sequent depth? Okay, okay. So let us look at this down here. <coughs> so this profile M2 we can get from GVF equation, and this is M3. That also we can get from GF equation and will extend up to critical length. And from this onwards, we can get sequent depth by this equation that we discussed earlier. Y2 divided by Y1 is equal to 1 by 2. R root of 1 plus A times F1 square, I think. And then minus 1. Okay, so that is the that is condition for hydraulic jump to happen. If Y1 and Y2 follow this equation, then so they are like, uh, so they are like uh, alternate depths or sequent depths? They are, all, they are sequent depths, right? They are not alternate depths. Alternate depths will be when uh, E1 is equal to E2. But in the hydraulic jump, E2 is not the same as E1. So they both are all sequent depths. So we are equating specific force at section 1 and specific force in section 2. Not in forces, no? Yes, and if, when we equate forces, we can get this equation. E1 and E2 do not equate. Does that make sense, Durgesh? Are you still? Yes, yes sir. Yeah. So, okay. So, if that is clear, there is an example, but I will not do that. I think uh, Rosa will do that. Or RF will do that. And this example is basically simpler. 
because in this case you don't have to the downstream is uniform profile upstream is a sluice gate and we know this is m3 profile downstream we know it's y2 depth right normal depth so that will be constant so the thing is will be much easier in this example let us see now hydraulic jump we'll discuss as an energy dissipator we still have 20 minutes and i'm sure that we can complete hydraulic jump today um, it can be used as an energy dissipator as we said um, we want to avoid high velocities downstream for example uh, this was your let's say in the previous let me take this example here so if we have let's say this is our depth initially let's say we did not have hydraulic jump right the flow velocities will be quite high because the kinetic energy will be quite high and if this bed is not properly product, uh, protected, it will get eroded and damaged, right? So we want this energy here, V1, which is quite high, we want to reduce this. Okay. So we want to decrease the energy, we want to dissipate its energy. And in that case, hydraulic jump is quite useful for us. And when we decrease the energies, when we decrease the velocity, uh, basically we are decreasing the velocity from V1 to V2. And this velocity is small, so it will avoid, it will help us avoid scouring. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> like I said earlier, the channel reach in which the jump, we make the jump to happen, that is called a slip basin. Okay. Let's say uh, again, I take this example. Let's say I take an example of spillway. This is your bed. So if I make this part, let's say concrete because i cannot go on making the entire channel as concrete because that will be too ex uh, expensive so i'll make this concrete this bed concrete and i will make the hydraulic jump to happen in this part only i'll make sure that the hydraulic jump doesn't happen beyond this thing so we'll see how we can do that so this part is called the stilling basin okay so stilling basin is the channel reach in which the uh, hydraulic jump happens so this bottom is paved because you want to resist scouring and natural soils cannot resist scouring. So we have to make a uh, reinforced concrete. And uh, in this section, what we do, we uh, dissipate the energy from the spillway because this from spillway, the velocity is quite high and we will dissipate the energy within the stilling basin itself. So it will prevent the damage of the foundation and also it will prevent us downstream scouring. There are different designs for this. One is SAF, USBR, Basin 1, Basin 2. Mostly in IS codes, you will see Basin 4 being used. Okay. And it's very simple. It's not that uh, difficult. Now let's see a hydraulic jump when it acts as an energy dissipator. What are the different cases we can have? So the first case is, let's say this was your initial depth. Okay, Either you have a spillway or you have sluice gate here. As so the flow is happening below this, flow is happening like this. So both cases are same basically. And uh, theory says that sequence depth is y2. What theory? That theory was y2 divided by y1 is equal to that half of the uh, root 1 f square, 1 plus 8 f square minus 1. That is f1 is equal to f. So that is this guy. But Downstream, this tail water depth, it doesn't have to be exactly equal to sequent depth, right? It depends on the downstream channel conditions. Okay, let's say if the downstream channel conditions was, for example, flooded. So then the depth of the flow downstream, which we call as tail water depth, tail basically is beyond this point, right? Beyond the spillway. The tail water depth can be anything. So let's call that as y2 dash. So in first case, we are assuming that the tail water depth is exactly equal to sequent depth. And this is our stilling basin. Okay, this is paved. Uh, you can see this is paved, for example. So this is a best case for us because jump will occur in the stilling basin itself. Okay, that because that's from the equation that we have, where y1 is y2, so we have designed stilling basin for this. The so jump one will happen exactly at that location. So this is ideal case for scouring. 
But if there is small change in this depth, let's say the tail water depth was a little bit lower in dry period, for example, the river downstream, it was um, um, it was dry, for example. So in that case, tail water will be lower. So that will create problems because the jump will not exactly happen at the stilling basin then. It will happen, let's say, downstream. So that is case one. In case two, what happens is the downstream depth of the flow is y2 dash and that is not exactly equal to y2 that we need for this depth y1 okay so the depth will not happen here right uh, in that case the flow will go down it will increase the, the the velocities will decrease owing to the friction so the depth will increase up to this point this point this point so we will have a new depth Corresponding to that, we have the tail water depth only in this equation. In this case, our equation uh, that uh, y2 divided by y1 will be satisfied. So the jump will not happen upstream on the stilling basin, it will happen downstream. Okay, in both the cases, uh, spillway and sluice gate, when the tail water depth is less than the sequence depth required. So it can cause carving because the jump is taking place at a location which is not protected or which is not paved. It can be natural surface. But it's case two. And the case, then there is third case, which is case three, when, for example, the downstream, the tail water depth is quite high. That can happen in case of floods. Uh, you have the river is completely flooded downstream also, and the depth of flow is very large. So initially what we want is we want the sequence depth to be y2, but our available depth is much more than that. Our available depth is y2 dash. So what will happen, the jump will occur, will happen on the stilling basin, but it will happen as a submerged jump. The jump will basically be moved forward upstream. So that is the safest, safest condition in terms of scour because only this part is paved, right? And on this, the jump is happening. Uh, jump is not happening downstream. So this is safest condition. But the problem is, it's not very useful for, as an energy dissipation because we know the submerged uh, jumps, they, uh, they don't uh, uh, dissipate so much energy if we had a normal jump. So those are three cases that might happen. Any questions in this? Raghav, any question? No, sir. <clears throat> okay. So, I think if you understood the previous discussion, this discussion on the next page also, that will be easy for you to follow. Uh, but let me give you a kind of idea what this is. So, <clears throat> normally what we make, uh, we, we design a hydraulic gem such that we know why one is this guy. And the tail water exactly matches the sequence water uh, sequence depth y2 is equal to y2 dash y2 dash is the actual depth of the tail water downstream you can see uh, case one happens when basically you have all the times the depth of the flow downstream and the sequence depths are same right for this for any discharge so what we say is if you increase the discharge the downstream depth of the flow and the sequence depth, they are all same. So we have one curve. Because the tail water, uh, the discharge doesn't have to be constant. On one day, discharge can be high. On the second day, discharge can be low. And consequently, the tail water depth, which is downstream of a spillway, it can be high, it can be low, right? But we can have an equation which tells us, OK, if the spillway discharge is Q, what is the likely dis what is the likely height or the depth of the flow downstream and we know okay for a discharge q we know the depth initial depth y1 so we can easily find out see one y uh, fluid number so we can easily find out y2 which is sequence depth so we can have purpose for them let's see okay the case one was simple for us at all the time regardless of the discharge both the uh, sequence depth and the tail water depth are same. In, in case two, you will see the jump height 
the Y2 that is required for the jump to happen is normally higher and the available depth is normally lower. Let's say this cube was 50 meter cube. And for that 50 water meter cube, our tail water available, tail water depth available is just three meters. But the sequent depth required is five meters. Okay. So this is basically a second case we discussed here, case two. In which case the let me remove this guy. In this case, the for the jump to happen on the spillway basin, the depth should have been this much, but available is only a little bit lower. So what happened? The jump will basically happen downstream. It will not exactly happen at the stilling basin. So that was the case too. Case three is when you have all the time the downstream water is kind of flooded. Okay, downstream river is flooded. So the tail water depth is normally higher than what is required for the jump. So in this case, jump will always happen upstream, right? Upstream of the location. So it will most of the time be a submerged jump. So those are three cases. Then there are some more cases here. Case four uh, is when the discharge, for lower discharge, the jump height required is high, but the available is less. So basically the depth available for the smaller discharges, the depth available is less. I would say the depth is this, but the required is this much. So hydraulic jump will happen downstream for smaller discharges. But for upper discharges, the depth, actual available depth is high and the required depth is low. So the jump will happen upstream. In this case, what normally they will do uh, to prevent this, uh, you can have some uh, sills here small uh, depth sills. So um, they can, this is made of concrete. And when once you have it, it can increase the depth in case of low discharges. So initially the, the depth for Q is this much, but when you in, uh, introduce a baffle or a sill here, the depth will increase up to this level. Okay. So similarly you have, sometimes you might want to drop the level to increase the depth Okay, but to decrease the depth, or you might want to increase the increase the slope so as to decrease the depth. Okay, so those cases you can discuss, you can think about those case four and case five. Okay, any questions in this? Okay, let me ask you a question then. So who can tell me what is this condition, case five? At least tell me for smaller discharges what happens. Where will the jump happen? I said this is small discharge. Who can tell me where will the jump happen? Will the jump happen on the stilling basin, which we have discussed, or will it happen downstream, or will it happen upstream? You know, submerged kind of thing. Who can tell me that for small discharges in this case? What is given is for discharge, what will be the tail water depth? What will be the jump rating curve? That means the sequence depth. Madhav, you can tell. Uh, Prince. Madhav, are you here? Yes, sir. Okay, can you answer? Yes, sir. Uh, what I have to tell, like, like <coughs> so this case five is like. Yeah, case five is you have two situations: one for high discharge, one for low discharge. I'm asking you, what will happen in low? Like, where will the jump happen when the discharge is low? Based on this, these two curves. So, so if I if I plot it like this, this is let's say spillway, and. Uh, this is the flow. This is your basin. And then this is the hydraulic jump. Now I'm asking you whether this hydraulic jump will happen on this basin or downstream or upstream of this basin based on the previous three conditions. Okay, so if you are not able to uh, answer, I will try to explain it a little bit more. 
So for small discharges, uh, the depth required, this is jump rating, the depth required for hydraulic jump to happen is, let's say this was three meters, right? But the available depth is how much? Five meters. So the depth required is three meters. Available depth is a little bit higher. So this is five meters. So the jump will basically move forward, move like here. The jump will happen here because the available depth is high. So that is for smaller discharges. For um, so that will be this case. This case here. Your required depth is Y2, but the available depth, tail water depth is higher. So the jump happens at this location on the submerged jump. So it basically happens upstream of the original, original location was this one. But because the tail water depth available is more, so the jump will move upstream. Now in the second case, in the higher discharge case, uh, what happens is your available depth is a little bit lesser. Okay, and the required depth is more, so the jump will happen downstream, somewhere here. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Uh, I have, I think, uh, two slides to go, and I think I can finish them. So I said, okay, we can make a uh, jump to happen in stilling basin. Uh, so what we have to know, what we have to have is something called controls, okay, controls of jump. So controls for jump are things that are uh, basically used to initiate a jump, because sometimes jump may never happen. But we want the jump to happen because we want an energy losses to be uh, maximum. We want scouring to be avoided. So we have to initiate a jump, and we have to make sure that its position is where we want it to be, on the concrete paved uh, stilling basin. So for that, we need to know, we need to find out what are the best controls. There are different controls that are used to start a jump and that are used to ensure its location. And it's done by something called sills. So sills are uh, almost same as the base, but they are, their height is very small. Okay, So they are not exactly spillways. Uh, sharp crested wear, broad crested uh, wears, and others we can have as um, controls. I have three minutes. For example, I'll explain here. Here is the bed of the channel. This is the initial velocity, and this is the final velocity V2. So jump might not happen, right, if the depth downstream is less. But what we can do, we can have a wear here, sharp crested wear, OK? This sharp crested wear, what it will do, it will increase the depth here. When it increases the depth here, the jump is more likely to happen. Okay, so that's why this is this acts as a control. Okay, so that is the idea of control. You just increase the depth by, for example, sills, and in in this case, a sharp uh, sharp crested wheel acts as a sill. The problem is theoretically we know that okay, uh, we can get the forces on this sharp crested wheel because we have to know okay if the height of the wheel is small then the depth will still not be that much okay what we, we need so we have to exactly know the height that we should design it for if we design it for 0.5 meters and that is not sufficient it's useless so we have to find out the exact height of this wheel and exact location of this wheel from this point to this point at what location should we design the sharp crested wear so that the jump happens within this reach only? Okay. Uh, there are experiments that have shown that the best position of this jump, of this wear, is just uh, when the depth Y2 is close upstream of the wear. So you can have something like Y2 here also, but they say, okay, best position is when the height of when the y2 is basically upstream of the wear that is when the low forces on this wear are small okay so we don't have to design it uh, extensively like with uh, a lot of reinforcement 
Uh, momentum theory can help, but that normally is not giving the satisfactory solution at, as to what should be the location and what should be the height of this cell. Uh, normally, dimensional analysis is done, and that is also based on experimental investigations. And people have derived equations for this and curves for this. This is one equation, this is one type of curve which helps us to give uh, the height of the jump and the location of the jump. Okay. So X basically in this figure is from this point to the location of the jump. So that will be X. We want to exactly know at what location this cell should be. Um, and then uh, H gives us the up to what height the cell should be made. For example, uh, in those experiments, X2, X divided by Y2 is kept as three, five and 10. You can have other values also. Uh, this curve, if you know fluid number one, which you should know, initial approach velocity should be known. And then you find out, okay, I want the location of the jump to be five. So I'll, I'll keep here five. Okay, then you can easily find out what should be the height of the jump, right? Easy. Uh, if, the, if this is your curve, x divided by y2 should be five. Normally for design, this is the best curve experiments have shown that this gives us the complete jump. Jump happens within this location, within this uh, string basin only for this x2 divided by x divided by y2. But let's say you selected this curve and your f1 was six. So that will tell you the height of the jump. Height should be three divided by whatever y1 is. So let's say y1 was uh, three. So three into three is nine. But sometimes if you design a if you design a wear which is a little bit higher, so in that case, the depth of the flow will be higher. So the basically hydraulic jump will move upstream. Okay, so we have to understand that also. Sometimes you will, okay, your height required is this much, but your jump is little bit, your height of the sill is little bit lower. So in that case, depth will be low and the jump will occur downstream of the channel. So these curves are extremely important for designing of these cells. At least the height of these cells and the location of these cells can be obtained from these curves. Okay, so that is it for today. Uh, next time we'll move on to uh, unsteady flow. So that, that la next lecture will be the last lecture. But I think uh, next Thursday, we will have one quiz also on the last three lectures. Do you guys have any questions on this? So I was asking which quiz you are um, dropping. Um, I have to see that. I have to see that. I don't know, maybe. Because, uh, I asked uh, my uh, asked Durgesh about this. So he said it was quiz three, and as far as I remember, it was quiz three, which were which was having something wrong in the last problem. The answer was not in the option. Um. I will, I will tell you, maybe tomorrow or today I will tell you exactly which quiz I am dropping. Okay, sir. Yeah, one quiz has to be dropped, unfortunately.